Good evening, moms and dads, and welcome to our webinar this evening. The second term of 2020 has been a time of many new things. For the first time in our 117-year-old history, the campus was closed for almost a term. And for the first time in our history, Highbury Boys started to learn through an online program from home. In our senior primary chapel service this morning, I commented to the, to the grade seven boys that none of our previous principals would ever have dreamed that they would be addressing boys who were sitting quite far apart from each other in the chapel, uh, wearing masks and um, enjoying the chapel service that way. These certainly are strange times. It's also the first time that Highbury is hosting a webinar. And so thank you to all of you parents who are at home and uh, joining in with us this evening. We are delighted to have an esteemed member of the Durban Medical Fraternity with us tonight. Dr. John Flett is a consultant general pediatrician who has practiced in the Durban area for the past 20 years. In his bio, Dr. Flett states that his work is 24 seven. It is hands-on in mother and childcare with level one neonatal units with oscillation ventilation, pediatric inpatient wards and accident and emergency units accepting level one trauma cases. His case complexity is varied from sub 500 gram neonates to 18 year old adolescents. He is involved in daily management of in the daily management of newborn infant neurodevelopment, scholastic learning disability and ADHD clinics. Dr. Flett is responsible for daily admissions through the accident and emergency departments, GP referrals, the labor ward, the pediatric intensive care of both medical and surgical cases in collaboration with specialist intensivists. Monthly outpatient consultants include 500, sorry, 350 to 400 children between birth and the ages of 18 years old, inpatient management of 200 to 300 children and newborns. Dr. Flett is the director and trustee of a medical center dedicated to the assessment and management of children with scholastic learning disabilities and mood disorders. One of the beneficiaries is a rural child protection school. Dr. Flett makes an active contribution to pediatric departmental audits. He is involved in education and mentoring of nursing staff and students. He has a passion for developing information technology programs and solutions for data collection, research, and patient educational online education. Dr. Flett has firsthand experience with Highbury as his son, Callum Flett, is a Highbury old boy from the year of 2011. John, welcome to Highbury, and thank you for offering to be with us this, this evening. And uh, we really look forward to what you have to share with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Roland. And it's a real pleasure and an honor to visit the Highbury campus once again. And what I'd like to do is to share with you parents and myself as a parent, I have a son who is due to go back to university and that is Callum. And we're sitting with also the same conflictions and concerns about whether we should be sending our son back. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you uh, some of the facts and evidence-based data that will help all of us parents make an informed decision. And what I'm hoping to do is enable parents to be able to answer the question, can I send my child back to school with confidence? And the only way one can do that with confidence is being in possession of reliable facts, not news cycle kind of fake news uh, kind of tweets. It's important that we all arm ourselves with the correct information and evidence-based facts that enables all of us to make a balanced decision on whether we should make that decision and send our children back. I've borrowed the words of Charles Dickens because the opening statement to the opening statement of the Tale of Two Cities 
which I've called the tale of two diseases, is kind of, it really does embody the kind of the, the hype and the noise and the buzz that we hear, bombarded every day by new cycles and information, lots of kind of advice given by various people. So what I'd like to say, it is the best of times. It is not the worst of times. It is the age of wisdom. And it is the age of some foolishness. It is the epoch of beliefs. It is the epoch of incredulity. And it is the season of light. And it is the season of darkness. It is also the season of hope. And it is during the winter of a bit of a despair. The, the disease COVID-19 nine months ago, none of us had any inkling of what it was all about. And what we found is that this disease almost kind of is a tale of two diseases. It kind of affects two age groups in a totally different way. It is kind of almost batting for different teams. But I've got to tell you that the younger team are winning. And it doesn't seem to affect the younger children quite as much as the older members. So grade sevens and eights are back this week. And I believe grade zero and grade one as well. We're at the very early stages of this pandemic. And we're all learning and our learning curves are increasing and changing every day. So at the moment, there are probably between 2,500 and 3,000 cases per day. The peak of the South African epidemic would probably peak around about six to 10,000 cases per day. We're only testing approximately 10% of the cases. That's the capacity we have. But what I want us to do is not focus on these percentages and these figures. You've got to focus on the facts. You've got to focus on our lives. You've also got to focus on what's important to us. I think it really draws on the importance of our families and the people that we connect with. So to truly answer that question as to whether we can send children back with confidence, what I'd like to do is to share with you some topics that will kind of arm you and kind of empower you with knowledge to make your own informed decision about the facts and also to ask questions. You know, what we do as doctors, we have a scientific community elsewhere in the world and also in South Africa, which we look to, we kind of draw our uh, kind of information from the experts. So what I'd like to do is share with you the following topics. I'd like to sketch the background to this COVID pandemic. I'm sure most of you are pretty much experts in understanding and probably can give a few lectures on your own. But what I'd also like to do is to particularly address those that are at risk. And specifically, how does this affect children? Children are presented as a unique group. It affects children in a completely different way. And as a pediatrician, you know, I see that in my practice and I kind of collaborate with colleagues elsewhere in the world. And we are all learning in real time how it's affecting children as a unique risk group. There are certainly risks about returning to school. There's risks about every aspect of our lives. And I think it's all about taking the correct balanced approach, weighing our options and making sure that you make the right decision for your family. There are certainly risks with not returning to school. And those are things that I think we need to think about when we make that decision and it's in the mix and we finally make the decision. And then finally, what I'd like to do is answer some of the questions. Some of them have been kindly presented before today. So I've had prior knowledge of those 
questions and had a chance to maybe think about some of the answers and share with you what I think. So if we can start off by talking about the background to this COVID-19 pandemic. For me to start off with kind of the take home message almost, this is something we can't avoid. There is no country that you can go to. I have had many patients that have been trapped overseas and here in South Africa, wanting to As they say, there is no real difference between being in South Africa and being elsewhere in the world. We are all in this together. There's no avoiding the reality. What this means is that the attitude and the kind of approach we have at the moment is something that we're going to have to follow through for the next two to three years. There are only two things that are going to bring this to an end. We have to wait until at least 60% of the human population have been exposed to this virus until enough people have been infected and have immunity. We're very fortunate in South Africa that we have over 50% recovery rate, which is quite amazing. And that kind of what we call herd immunity, I mean, we're not a bunch of cattle, but what it really means is that it's a similar kind of analogy. If you go overseas, you might go to a country where you pick up traveler's diarrhea but you don't find people there coming down with traveler's diarrhea. We've got to kind of develop our own natural immunity with time. And it's kind of like going to a malaria area. We take tablets, but the local people don't take tablets every day. So that is one aspect that we've got to wait for. And then we can't hold our breath. We might not get, we might not be able to develop a vaccine in fact, there's only been one vaccine against a respiratory virus that, they, that we've been able to manufacture, and that is the smallpox vaccine. And that took over 160 years. So we have to, I think, focus, we have to kind of have a philosophy on what we're gonna do for the next two to three years. The background, it's all about bats and never heard of a pangolin before this. And there's these terms called zoonoses. So it's a disease that kind of infects animals that can be transmitted to humans. And a very common example, apart from the COVID-19, is believe it or not, ringworm. You can catch it from pets. There are lots of other examples. Uh, rabies would be another one. So these are diseases that probably are related to our climate and the way we are affecting our climate and climate change. So it helps us reflect at this stage how we treat our environment, treat each other, and help us sharpen our kind of our connections and attitude to what we do every day. Worldwide, there are 4 million cases and unfortunately 400,000 deaths. In South Africa, I've had to adjust actually just in a couple of days to my talk, the numbers are increasing. We have over 50,000 cases. This is probably a tip of the iceberg. It's underreported because we're only testing about 10%. And unfortunately there are over a thousand deaths. But worldwide, of all these cases of nearly half a million deaths, only 200 children have been reported as having died from COVID-19. Almost 99% of these children have had very serious underlying medical conditions. So there, at this, even at this stage, there is solid evidence that we've learned from this short six months that children are kind of in a different risk category. And pandemics tend to happen every 100 years. So we're living in a very, very kind of interesting time and a time that we've got to, I think, reflect on and look at every moment of our lives and make the most of it. How does COVID spread? 
there are two major ways in which a respiratory virus can spread. And one is by droplets, and that is COVID. And then there's something called airborne disease. And they are very distinct. And airborne disease is something that's very difficult to avoid. An example of that would be chickenpox. So you could be kind of in a school and not be in the same class as a child with chickenpox and still get chickenpox. They could be two classrooms away. COVID is a droplet spread. It's a specific. You can take added measures to avoid it. So in a way, an analogy would be like a light mist. That would be kind of an airborne disease. And then, of course, a droplet spread disease could be an analogy of a kind of like a, a light shower or some dew. And the only way that you can kind of be infected is if you breathe it in by your respiratory system. Contact with the eyes, nose, and mouth. So by washing your hands, not touching your face, is the most important measure than anybody can take. Wearing a mask is a respect for other people. It stops those droplets from being spread. It is kind of not so much for the person who has a problem, but it's, for, it's, it's to prevent the spread to other people. So this whole issue of sanitization of hands has to be at the cornerstone of any preventative measure. Gatherings, of course, more people together, how they gather, how they separate. These are aspects that we all are navigating and learning. For children, they don't always understand these things. They are social beings. And schools are happy places where they interact with each other. So this is gonna be a real big learning curve for all of us and our children. And at the, same, at the same stage, we're going to be able to prevent many other diseases. And children will generally end up being a lot healthier this year. I think. With COVID, it's an asymptomatic problem. So you can actually have the disease, but not spread it or have any symptoms, which makes it very difficult. Unlike the seasonal flu, influenza A, and swine flu that we see every year. You kind of have those symptoms. You have to have those symptoms to be able to spread it. Those symptoms of flu, nose, runny nose, sore throat, body aches and pains, fever. You know that you have it so that you can avoid going to school or infecting someone else. COVID, you don't. It's an asymptomatic problem. There we go. Sorry. So the next category would be those that are at risk. Two major categories. One is based on age. The other is related to your underlying medical susceptibility, your genetics, other conditions that you have. Comorbidities means that there's Age is a huge factor. And I'll go on to show that only 9% of South Africans are over the age of 60. So we're blessed with a country of relatively young people. So that has to point in a direction for South Africa. So if you're 80, you're 70 times more likely than a 40 year old of having serious disease and dying. And 60 to 70, 25 times greater chance than a 40 year old. Medical conditions that I'm sure everybody hears at nauseam and thinks about, but high blood pressure, it kind of like puts pressure on your tubes and your blood vessels, diabetes, in particular type 2. Even children that have type 1 diabetes are not usually at risk. It's the type 2. And type 2 diabetes is almost unheard of in children. Underlying serious heart conditions. Children are often born with those conditions. They don't generally acquire them. Those are more adult-related issues. And obesity, being overweight. 
Obesity is essentially an inflammation condition. It causes inflammation to your body, making you more susceptible. So these are problems, and particularly obesity and weight issues. Those are things that, by doing healthy exercise, being involved in activities, changing our diets, will make a big, big difference. On the right, there is a study that showed in the early stages of the distribution of ages, of deaths. And you can see this is some early evidence, which I'll go on to show you in many studies that are based on evidence-based research, how low and almost unaffected children are. The symptoms of COVID-19 are almost the same as the seasonal flu. 80% are very mild. Very mild to not seek medical attention. You could take some lozenges, some panado, and with time, you get better. You do not need antibiotics. These are viruses. In percent will only be hospitalized. And a very small percent will need intensive care. The death rate worldwide up until now has been between 2 and 3%. In South Africa, it's about 2.6. That compared to every year, there are at least 12,000 South Africans that die from the normal influenza A, which other people know as swine flu or very similar. There are also probably as many people that die from TB. So those are things that one's got to reflect on, and reflect on the risk of the current problem. What I've tried to do is give a scenario and look at across the board in South Africa and take a thousand South Africans over the next two to three years and compare their risk and show you how this virus will affect us and what the outcomes will be. So if we look at different people, that's over the next two to three years, 70% will be affected. And of those 70%, 80% will be completely asymptomatic and not show any signs whatsoever, not even know that they've been affected. Of the 20% will have very mild limiting disease, almost like a normal flu. So you can already see a very small percentage. Now, this is also looking at the broad age range. This is an average. So this is not kind of a reflection on younger people or children. Of, of those asymptomatic people, you get 20% that have self-limiting disease, and only about five to 10% will be hospitalized. And the overall death rate over that time period is gonna be 0.8%. Now, if we look at a younger population between the ages of 18 and 40, you can see that the hospitalization is a lot smaller, almost 2%, and probably one in a thousand will die. I haven't even bothered to put the data for children because it is so insignificant and doesn't even kind of register on my diagram. This is the latest If you have a look at the left-hand side of that graph, that almost 32% of South Africans are children. Only 9% are in the risk category of over 60. So already you can see that by 9% are in a hugely different risk category. We obviously have to take into account underlying medical problems that South Africans have like HIV and TB. But the focus for me is children. And you can see that there's a large proportion of South Africans that won't be at risk. I'm going to be showing some various studies. 
try not to be too bamboozled by all these graphs. I must say, when people give me graphs, I sort of tend to switch off. But the point I'm trying to make is, if you have a look, this is trying to illustrate the connection between somebody who gets infected and who they infect. If you're an older person, you're more likely to socialize with somebody who's older. So you're more likely to infect older people. If you are a child, you're more likely to spend your time with children of the same age. Makes sense. And I'll go on to show you that children are not a risk to each other. So as a result, you can see early on in this graph that they don't really affect each other. And the incidence of infection in young children is very low. So the next kind of category is how COVID-19 affects children. What symptoms do children display? The most common is fever, sore throat, tiredness, body aches and pains. They can also have diarrhea. You might have heard of the loss of smell and taste, weakness, sometimes breathing problems. There's also been a connection in the media, I mentioned it because it's it's been highlighted, although it's incredibly rare. Something called a systemic inflammatory response syndrome called Kawasaki disease. This is so rare that when we do see a case, it obviously makes media attention. This is something that children are not really at risk of, de of, of developing. So they can develop all the symptoms that you can imagine with the common cold and normal flu every year. Infections in children initially were, and children were blamed as what we call super spreaders. And that was in the early stages of the pandemic, when a lot of information and research wasn't really analyzed. And one of the factors was it came from children were often looked at as the vectors and spreaders. But this was conflicted by the fact and when we, when we analyzed the data, Children have a one-child policy. They have fewer children in their, midst, in their midst. And this tended to confuse the data. But with future studies, we realize that this is not the case. It spares children. We don't actually know why children are not affected. Over time, we will certainly begin to understand. And on the right-hand corner, there is a diagram there of something called the ACE2 inhibit, uh, uh, receptor. These are kind of like little chemicals that are needed for the virus to be able to land on and infect. Somehow children don't have these, don't have as many. And this is a key factor. Although it's an interesting point, we will then with time find out exactly why this is the case. This slide is to illustrate how important vaccination is. And this would apply to both adults, teachers, as well as children. The diagram shows R value, something called Rho. In other words, representing how infectious a disease is. So a Rho value of one would mean that how many one person would infect one other person. Now with seasonal flu, one person has the ability to infect one and a half people. You can see with COVID it's two and a half, just one more person, something that didn't affect South Africa called SARS, that was far more virulent. And the take home message is measles. It's a very infectious disease. With the Ebola outbreak in Africa recently, parents became panic stricken, kept their children at home, they stopped vaccinating. There was a huge deficit in vaccination. Currently, there is a massive outbreak of measles, causing more death, death in children 
and spread of disease than Ebola ever did. And there's a huge danger in putting off vaccination. It's a very simple way to protect your immune system. South Africa has an amazing immunization program. It is free. So it is something that I would really encourage every parent to really kind of pay attention to. It is probably the most important aspect of one of those risks that you can mitigate. So we've spoken about the background, who's at risk, how it affects children. I'm talking about how unique children are with COVID-19. Coming back to what I was saying about the tale of two cities and two diseases, adults and children are in two separate categories. This slide is an important slide because it illustrates how different children are in the way they carry the virus. So if we kind of move from left to right, it almost kind of looks like a diagram, looks like a bit of a Christmas tree. And children under the age of six years, you can see how little compared to the right-hand corner of those that are over the age of 45. And this really kind of illustrates how many viruses that are in somebody's mucus or sputum or in their respiratory tract. And you can see with logic there that the less you have, the less likely you are to infect someone else. I see this illustrated in my practice where if a child contracts chickenpox at school, they tend to have a very mild disease because they don't live with that child necessarily. But if they pick up chickenpox from a sibling in the same family, they have a very serious bout of chickenpox. And this is all about viral load. How much were you given? How much was your immune system overloaded and couldn't cope? You can see in the age category right up to age 11 or 12, this would cover probably the junior school. It is very, very small and really helps us understand why children are at such reduced risk of passing it on to each other, as well as to adults. Adults pass it on to children. There are gonna be some studies I'm gonna show you. I'm not gonna go into them in too much detail, but these are studies from South Korea. South Korea is doing amazing work. The Icelandics, the Scandinavians, the Italians had a really bad experience, so we're learning from their experience. And you can see in this diagram, this shows per age of somebody who they infect. Now, it stands to reason if you're older, you mix with older people, so you're more likely to infect them. But you can see the absolute dearth and almost absence right up to the age of 18 because children don't infect each other. There's another example of a study which is illustrating another study from another European country. So this one looks a bit complicated. All those little dots kind of indicate, you can see the density of dots, kind of in the older age category on the right, very few down below in the lower age category. Just further supportive evidence of this fact. There again, complete absence in children of infecting each other. This is an Australian study, which I was fortunate enough to study with this um, gentleman, Saul Faust. He's a professor in Melbourne, the university. And he has done some very important work in Australia, looking at the reintroduction and going back to school of Australians. And I'll show you just now some of the work that he's been doing and illustrating how few children are affected. So we've done 
we've gone through the background, the risks, Really, there are two important risk categories. There are teachers and there are children. Children that have serious underlying medical problems, they need to kind of seek advice from the medical professionals. They need to discuss the underlying medical problems with their doctors and be aware of them. Teachers obviously need to do the same. And the risk in a school is one aspect. But when children leave school, they are at increased risk. We can reduce the risk at school, but it's important to consider how children socialize, what they do outside of school. What can we practically do to reduce these risks? We've spoken about vaccination. If your child is sick, you can screen them at home. Being a vigilant parent, being aware of symptoms, being responsible, not sending your child to school. That is the first step. Making sure that underlying problems are treated and dealt with early. Over the last three months, I've seen many cases of illnesses, simple, that have been left and kind of have got a lot worse. The children have landed up in hospital, skin infections, things that maybe wouldn't have happened in normal circumstances. So be proactive, make sure that those simple things don't become complex things. For complex medical problems, seek specialist advice. Make sure that you discuss with your pediatrician or doctor underlying medical problems, and they will be the best people to be able to help you decide. I've had many requests from parents, with children with underlying epilepsy, asthma, underlying allergies. These are not contraindications to going back to school. And as I've said earlier on, limit out of school contacts. Look at your risk out of school. There may be siblings of children that have other underlying problems. That would be another reason to seek expert advice. And it stands to reason healthy lifestyle, eating, exercise, sleeping, also looking after mental health. This is going to be a time that's going to test anxiety of all of us, stress, pressures. Parents, not just sending their children back to school, but they're going back to work. It's also a lot of factors to consider. Even with conditions, even with HIV on treatment, mild immune diseases, treated heart conditions, allergy, well-controlled asthma, epilepsy, or can quite easily go back to school. A colleague of mine who's a child specialist of the lungs, a pulmonologist, who deals with children with very serious conditions with the lung, or cystic fibrosis, she's even recommending that they go back to school. So this is not something that you need to worry about. I'm sure get the right advice. Which children should not go back to school? So there's a list of more serious problems. And I think they kind of are obvious. There are things that maybe stand out. So whether you're a sick teacher, developing a cold or flu, learners, If at all unsure, rather get the advice early. This is a slide that I came across not even three days ago. It is a slide that looks at 
all the viral infections over the last three years that have been detected in the community. Now, believe it or not, there are lots of other coronaviruses. Coronaviruses, in fact, that is one of the reasons that we think children may be slightly protected against COVID-19, that there's cross protection, that they've come up against other illnesses. So there are, as you can see, influenza A, lots of rhinoviruses, RSV is a major infection in South Africa, causes lots of wheeziness. So the different colors that are represented, the blue is 2018, the red is 2019, and the green is 2020. And you can see there is a dramatic reduction this year. Partly because children have been isolating and away from schools and from each other. But these are conditions that happen every year. So I would say that if you had to choose to send your child to school in 2020, with all the measures that the schools have in place, it will probably be the healthiest your child will have ever been in the last five years. There's a, uh, some more studies just to remind you. This is an Australian study where they took 800 students and followed them up when they reintroduced themselves to school. There were nine students and nine staff members from 15 schools that tested positive over a period of time. The little red dot in the top left-hand corner was the only child that infected someone else and by the time that child was tested they'd recovered without symptoms so this is a real prospective study showing that with the right measures in place and bearing in mind the australian scenario and experience is going to be different to south africa but if the school can take measures and put them in place we can achieve what the australians are achieving So to remind ourselves, we've been through all the major categories. And I'd like to just finally share some of my own perspectives of the risk of staying at home. Over the last three months, I have seen children who generally are on medication to help their height. All in three meters from trees, with brain injuries, because of parents having to go back to school, away from school, so to work, supervision, there's a huge kind of danger to children in some respects. Emotional development, economic impact, keeping children at home, not being able to go back to work. And then there's an important part of educating your immune system. To live on planet Earth, you've got to kind of have a good immune system. So I'm confident that this virus, COVID-19, is not a big risk to children, but it's important for them to develop an immune system and a healthy immune system to other viruses. And we can't necessarily keep our children at home for two to three years. I think that's an important thing to think about. We've got to have a strategy of what we're going to do over the next three years. There are obviously children that have special needs, special education needs, that cannot be kind of taught at home. And it's important for children's emotional development, their brains need to be stimulated in ways that you cannot do at home. The neural connections and pathways, educational, emotional, scholastic, those are things that children need to develop in groups with each other. So I've covered most of the categories that I thought I would cover this evening. And just as a summary, children are far less likely to get infected and infect others. They have very mild symptoms. 
the experience elsewhere in the world and what we know, the South African age population, it is safe to go back to schools. Only those with severe underlying illnesses should not go back. Schools that are sensible will decrease your child's risk and provide the much needed education to the developing brain at a sensitive stage in development. Early stages of the uh, pandemic, knowledge is evolving. We will know more in six months time. In 2020, it will be the healthiest year for your child to go back to school. Schools are the safest place to have your child because there's the least amount of COVID. Safer than some homes, safer than outside. Children are at the lowest risk at school because they're surrounded by children. Thank you. Can we deal with some of the questions? Yeah. There have been some very interesting questions, and I think um, there are some parents that certainly practice critical thinking. One of the questions that I have seen is, is it okay for children to sweat? Well, I think if they are enjoying their school and they are active, and you're getting your money's worth at school, I think they should sweat and run around and have fun. Sweat is not a source of COVID. The source is from the respiratory tract. It is from mucus. It's from leaking noses, saliva. So I don't believe that children that sweat and have some droplets spread onto other children inadvertently, that is a risk. And another question that is that was asked. Is it necessary for children to wear masks for the duration of the school morning, especially if they are socially distanced from each other? I've heard prolonged mask use is damaging to health. Is this true? I really don't believe that there's any evidence that wearing a mask is damaging. Some parents think that it makes it more difficult for a child to breathe, puts more strain on the lungs. And, you know, in different parts of the world, even during previous epidemics, the SARS and the MERS, where people had to wear masks, we know a lot about wearing masks. There does not seem to be any issue, as long as the masks are sensible and are breathable. So I think that wearing masks is legislation in South Africa, particularly out in public. But it's important to wear a mask where you cannot socially distance far enough apart. And I think that should be, I think I would certainly leave that up to sensible kind of interventions from schools and supervision. But I, I do believe that they are safe. The other question was, is it safe for children at school to have shared objects, toys, particularly kind of in the young developmental part of the school, in the preschool, such as Lego in the foundation phase. Unfortunately, all objects are a potential risk. And it's probably going to need children maybe to bring their own kind of toys or activities, or the toys need to be sanitized. And unfortunately, I think they're going to be a source of infection. So those are things that I think any object, whether it's a book, books have shiny covers, they have paper, these are all potential kind of risks. There's not a lot of research that's been done, particularly looking at school introduction and sharing of books, utensils, and that kind of thing. But I think with time, we will start to know. There's not enough research at this point, but we have to accept that there are potential risks. Another question is, what is the psychological impact of children having to wear masks and socially distance themselves from friends and teachers? I think that really is a risk. 
I think it, we, 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 we have to talk about it, help children talk about these things. In my experience as a pediatrician, children are not as affected psychologically as their parents. Children are very accepting. If they can see that their parents are well adapted and managing, they certainly look to their parents. But children are caught in the moment. They live for now. They don't necessarily have that time frame where they are worried about all these existential things that I think adults and all of us as adults do. So I think there will be a group of children that will be, I think, emotionally and also suffer from anxiety. But these are times for us to deal with those specific risks and specific interventions. And it's just good practice to talk about things, allowing children to articulate, talk about their fears. Just talking is therapy on its own. And they're always going to be in schools, they're going to be medical professionals, they're going to be mental health professionals that are going to be able to uh, address these issues. And another question was, many of the people dying from COVID-19 have underlying comorbidities or are quite old. Wouldn't they be vulnerable to dying from the flu anyway? Is COVID-19 really that different? Well, I think I probably have to agree with some of the things that have been mentioned there, that it is a risk to older people. And there are many diseases that do affect old people. We don't necessarily think about them, but preoccupy ourselves in the past. We haven't thought about those things. But maybe it highlights other diseases and how important it is to manage other diseases like influenza, having the flu vaccine, for example. You know, there is something that's available today that can prevent something that causes 10,000 to 12,000 deaths in South Africa. You know, we don't need to wait for a vaccine, it's available and it is relatively cheap. You can go to a local discam or pharmacy. They can do it for less than 50 rand. And any child at school going age, I feel should consider the flu vaccine. If you're not allergic to egg, then there's no real contraindication. Any other questions? Um, Dr. Flett, I'll read you a few other questions that are coming through yeah. on the live stream. Um, if you have a high risk parent, would you advise that the child stay at home or would the risk of spread be low to the parent? Right. So that was a particular question that I received today myself. So that's a very good and a pretty common question. It depends on what the condition or the comorbidity of the parent. So there are sometimes some perceived conditions that parents may have that may make them believe that they are at high risk. They may be surprised that there are very few conditions that make them at increased risk. And bearing in mind children are not the ones that pass it on to their parents. So that there is a very low risk of a child, particularly one of the questions I get asked, you know, what happens, can, can my child go and visit the grandparents? You know, are they allowed to, um, you know, I think there's, it's the same kind of question, you know, a healthy grandparent versus a grandparent that's older. Unfortunately, all of us do get older. And all of us, you know, there are conditions that occur the older we get. We've got to be mindful of those factors. But I think, you know, if you get the right advice, it gives you the confidence to be able to allow your children to interact. You know, there are um, that emotional connection between families, still very important. And also not to necessarily, um, you know, a parent that is stressed that they, they send their child back to school, they're going to now kind of be more at risk. So I think there are some conditions, as I've mentioned, high blood pressure, 
kind of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, but there are very few conditions that make somebody at increased risk. So just to get the right advice, I would say. Great. Okay. We have another question. Um, if my child has an IgA and IgG immune deficiency, mm. should they go back to school? So that's a good question. Um, an IgA deficiency is the most common variety of an immune deficiency, of a primary immune deficiency. So that is the most common. Now, it would that child would probably more, be more at risk from other viruses every year. And in fact, it's a common scenario for a pediatrician to be faced with a child with low immunity. So I would say that the risk is not increased with COVID. It, that child would probably be more at risk from RSV virus, mm -hmm. from influenza virus. And if they have a history of having overwhelming infections, been admitted to hospital with pneumonia more than twice, that risk needs to be, I think, dealt with, and that family should get the advice from their pediatrician. Yeah, There's you. no doubt about that. Okay. Uh, another question is, um, do the teachers and children have to wear a mask as well as a face shield? Or, in your opinion, is a face shield enough? So that, I think, you know, the advice that has been given by the health department and the health minister and has been legislated is a policy that has to apply to the entire education system and population at large. So wearing a mask is a legal requirement in public. To be able to utilize a face shield. So if one is within that two meter or one and a half meter kind of distance, a mask must be used. I think where there is maybe a further distance, um, I think a face shield is definitely appropriate. Um, so I think the, the scenario and the control of that environment now, there's other factors like ventilation of the room, space of the room, the number of people in the room. So I think the combination of the mask and the shield, some people might argue that it's not necessary, particularly if the distance is sufficient. But I think one has to accept that if you're out in public, you know, to just wear a visor is not filling the legal requirements. And I have seen actually recently just going into some, some shopping centers where there were individuals with a visor, they were asked to put on a mask. So I think that might be an area that needs to be, I think, debated. But I think at the moment that in close contact, I think a mask, but an environment where there needs to be some protection and there's sufficient distance, I think, advisor is acceptable. Great. We'll um, do two more questions um, and then finish off. Thank sure, you, pleasure. Dr. Flett. So um, what is your advice should someone test positive in the school? Should we shut down the school? Yes. So I think that there is definitely, over the next two to three years, going to be several cases. And I saw in the Mercury, actually, while I was standing at the checkout today, two schools have been closed because there have been children that have tested positive. So I think that the point is, is that testing positive was the fact that you just tested, whether they're symptomatic or not, were they ill? And I think we're gonna find going forward that if you had to randomly test everybody, in six months, a year's time, there are going to be a large proportion of people that are positive. So if the correct measure is in, in place, where each school have their own protocols and they've followed the right protocols, they've set up the right protocols, there won't be a need to shut an entire school down. Like there is not the need to shut down an entire hospital 
when one person is tested positive because you wouldn't have a health system anywhere in the world functioning, let alone an education system. So I think as long as if someone, and, and in fact, I think it's inevitable that there's going to be somebody who's going to test positive. Great. And if you have the right process, the right contact tracing, and you deal with it as a unit, as an entity, I don't think a school should be in trouble at all. Thank you. So then our last question um, uh, is, should the children be running around playing soccer with masks on? Is it detrimental to your health to exercise with a mask on? I think it depends on the mask. So if it's a tight fitting mask that doesn't allow easy breathable and allowing a child to easily ventilate. So I think there are a variety of masks and I don't know. I mean, the, the sport reintroduction in the world hasn't happened. Maybe there will be a different sports mask. I don't know, you know, versus a schooling mask. You know, I mean, for example, um, Surgical masks are different to masks that you use in different scenarios. There are N95 masks that people have learned about. So I think as long as it's allowing proper ventilation, it should certainly not cause any lung problems. It is only going to make the whole experience of exercising possible. I think without that mask, there wouldn't be probably soccer being played among the children. I think it's a means to an end. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Willow. Thank, Thank you, you. Dr. Flecht, for, for sharing of your time and expertise with us this evening. I know that you have delayed many years and answered many questions. Knowledge, information is power, and through sharing of data evidence-based research and scientific facts, you have empowered us to make decisions and choices for our children and that we are comfortable with. And for that, we thank you. Mums and dads, thank you for joining us this evening. You've also heard that 2020 is the healthiest year to be a school. So we expect you now to go and share all the good news that you've heard this evening, be encouraged and take care. Thank you.